Welcome to Free Media, I'm Robbie Suave. And I'm Amber Duke. Vice President Kamala Harris has chosen her own Veep, and that man is Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. Walz was the preferred choice of leftist progressives, but the mainstream media also seems quite fond of him. Check out the fawning coverage from CNN. What an incredible contrast we have now on the Democratic ticket with Kamala Harris uh, and Tim Walls on it at the same time. Uh, we have somebody in Kamala Harris who embodies uh, the dynamism, the innovation uh, of uh, big cities, particularly in the coasts uh, of this country. And then in Tim Walls, we have somebody who sort of embodies uh, the proud, the resilient, the hardworking, uh, patriotic middle of the country. And I do think that we can easily imagine Imagine Tim Walls very much embracing and leaning into that contrast. He is somebody who can get up uh, on the uh, campaign stage and say to the American people, look, uh, I might not have gone to law school. I was uh, busy serving in the military. Uh, I was busy being a high school teacher. I may not be uh, from a big city on the coast. I was born in a small town in Nebraska. And yet I share uh, all of these fundamental values that Kamala Harris uh, holds dear. I love the hard-hitting coverage of Democrats that we got from the mainstream media for that narrow period of time when they really wanted Joe Biden to drop out <laughs> of the race. Now we're back to this. Um, we're going to go over uh, Tim Wall's record a little bit more in depth in another um, uh, video. I think right now the you know the big question is how does this change the race? Um, leftists seem thrilled with this choice. This was who progressives wanted. Conservatives also seem thrilled with this choice because this is who they want to run against. And I think they were perceiving people on the right that Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, who is the alternative pick, was going to be a really formidable uh, uh, person to run against, was going to do Kamala Harris some good in the must-win state of Pennsylvania, and instead she went with Walls. Yes, it seems like she has basically caved to the progressive pro-Palestinian base, which was very angry about Shapiro even being considered because he wrote this essay in college 20 years ago where he talks about volunteering for the IDF. It turns out he like took a trip to Israel and like picked carrots or something yeah. on a farm that was, I guess, affiliated with He's the Israeli part of a foreign military. <laughs> right. God damn it! Um, and talked about how Palestinians are incapable of having peace, and then of course recently has criticized the mob violence and riots that took place on college campuses in reaction to uh, a lack of a ceasefire being advanced by the Biden administration. Um, but what's kind of funny, and, and again, we will talk more about his policies later in the show, but Tim Walls has very similar positions on Israel. Yeah. So I'm so not- does, So do most Democrats. Right. So do virtually everyone. And, and I don't even, I don't, you know, even necessarily uh, agree with their policies or the Republicans. I do want the U.S. to be less involved in the Middle East. I think you do too, to yep. some extent. And, you know, it's a very thorny issue. Um, and one where there is, I, I think, a lot of uh, disagreement among people both right and left with what, you know, the American bipartisan foreign policy consensus has been for so long. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of, it's vibes based. I mean, they're going to be, whether it's Shapiro or Waltz, they're going to be on a ticket with Kamala Harris, who is in the administration doing all of the, you know, from the uh, pro-Palestinian side, pro-Israel things and support for Israel that has made the left activists so mad. And I just question the wisdom of like your campaign strategy being we need to keep the very left-wing people happy because my experience now and having gotten to know people on the left a little bit better in uh, terms of the media stuff we're doing is that they are impossible to please and it doesn't matter. But you can't make them happy and you shouldn't try. It would be my advice to Democrats if they were taking my advice for some reason. Well, I think you're right. And I think most of them will end up coming home, so to speak, anyway, yeah. regardless of who Kamala chooses as VP. Um, she's trying to make this calculation that whoever her VP is has to help her hang on to those uh, Rust Belt states that Biden successfully flipped over from Trump yeah. in 2020. Well, she's and, right about that. Yeah, that's, and, that's, the, that's the race. That's the election. But I think actually she would be better served trying to win the Sun Belt, uh, yeah. Nevada, Arizona, mm. et cetera, because I just don't think that 
having an ostensibly pro-labor position is going to help outweigh the fact that they are incredibly progressive on every other issue, particularly social and cultural issues that do matter to white working class voters. Yeah, and to the, the energy issues, the green stuff. That's which right. Which I think is just going to prove to be lethal. Again, we're going to get into that, uh, more of that. Um, I also think there's something about this pick, like it reminds me, frankly, of Hillary Clinton's decision to pick another Tim, Tim Kaine, most forgettable guy on the planet. I can barely remember his name some days. Um, she picked someone, Senator from Virginia, to be her running mate who would not overshadow her in any way. This was the Hillary show. You know, she thought she was going to sail to the presidency. It was her time. She did not take seriously the idea that Donald Trump could beat her. In fact, she preferred for Donald Trump to be her opponent because she thought he was the least likely to put up any formidable challenge. And uh, Tim Kaine added nothing. He didn't really subtract anything either, but it wasn't like a liability. But, you know, it's a missed opportunity. In the, in the same way, I don't see this guy as, um, he's not going to outshine Kamala Harris. He's kind of, you know, he's folksy and good on TV. I, I think he's a rhetorically gifted political figure. Um, he'll do fine in a debate, but he's not, uh, he's not going to be a star in his own right. And I guess that's what, uh, that's what Hillary wanted, and that seems to be what Kamala wanted. That seems a little bit of a, you know, well, be careful what you wish for kind of situation because it is, it is so close. As we're, <laughs> every day as we're filming this right now, things could change, but uh, the election is truly so close. Either person could win and like small differences could make up the, you know, if she, Kamala Harris loses Pennsylvania by 0.3%, when she would have won it if she had Josh Shapiro, that's like the that's the entire election. Yeah, so well, I don't know. Uh, you I don't get it. <laughs> well, me neither. I mean, you mentioned vibe space. I'm pretty sure that the only reason he even got a look in the first place is because he went on TV to call Trump and Vance weird. Yeah. And the Kamala campaign ran with that to the ends of the earth. They're obsessed with she calling hasn't them weird. She about she it. She has not stopped. <laughs> the cackling continues. And to me, this is actually further proof that they are genuinely scared of J.D. Vance mm -hmm. um, as much as they have uh, sort of laughed and, and joked about him over the past couple of weeks. She wouldn't be so obsessed with picking an ostensibly white working class representative if they didn't think that J.D. Vance legitimately is added something to, to the Trump ticket. I mean, the fact that Andy Bashir was even being considered because he's the Kentucky governor yeah. could not be diametrically more different than J.D. Vance. I mean, this is a, a Nepo baby who is from one of the most wealthy, political connected families from Louisville, Kentucky. Whereas J.D. Vance's family is from rural eastern right. Kentucky and then moved north for manufacturing jobs. Like, they, it, it, they clearly don't really understand what type of person appeals to the white working class, but they're doing their best to give the, the sort of chipped, painted facade of it. I think they absolutely want to neuter that uh, potential for J.D. Vance or Republicans more broadly to make a play for uh, the white working class, for labor unions, for those kinds of people by having someone who culturally speaks to those values or sounds like that's what he's all about. And then, of course, you know, we're going to get into his uh, record in a minute, so let, we'll turn to that next. More free media. Stay with us.